10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ladies and gentlemen, from New York City, the Los Angeles of the East Coast, it's the second annual Veto Award, sponsored by Movie. Please welcome your host, Patrick Willow. Is the hypology machine ready? I'm not sure. I had to siphon a lot of extra power from the building to unlock the award show setting. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much everyone. And welcome to the Veto Awards, which I guess is like an annual thing now. Just wanna say it is a huge honor to be back once again hosting the only award show created by me where I make all the rules and pick all the winners and it is extremely unlikely that anyone else will ever or would ever want to host this. We are currently two full months into 2024, and yet, we are all still talking about the same movies from 2023. And we're sick of it. We are all dying to move on and start discussing this year's exciting new film offerings like Night Swim and Argyle, but we are culturally obligated to keep on arguing about Poor Things and Maestro until March 10th. When the Oscars finally happen, award season finally ends, and we're all released from this prison of endless discourse. So I know that you're sick of hearing the words Oppenheimer, and Barbie, and Quantumania. I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to hear them a few more times in the next hour. A actually, actually not Quantumania though. We're, uh, I think, I think we're done with that one. But what a year for the movies, huh? Looking back at 2023, it really felt like this might be a turning point for American film. The superhero movie dominance started to collapse with the underperformance of The Flash, The Marvels, and Qu the Ant Guy movie. And instead, a three-hour R-rated drama made almost a billion dollars, while also making TikTokers clutch their collective pearls over Killian Murphy's nipples being shown in IMAX. <laughs> Tech giant Apple realized that it's actually good and smart and profitable. I do love that money, sir. <laughs> to release movies in movie theaters. And meanwhile, Netflix continued to fuck that up and keep releasing all their movies the way every director intended them to be seen, playing on a TV in the other room while you clean your kitchen. Look, last season we spent a lot of time bemoaning the state of cinema, talking about all the many problems currently plaguing it, accusing certain studio heads of being serial killers, and while the jury is still out on those accusations, we're not gonna dwell on any of that tonight. No, tonight I, like a proper Irish person, will bury all the problems down deep so that I don't bother other people with them, and in the process, probably causing severe personal trauma and cirrhosis of the liver. Tonight is a night for celebration, because no matter what problems there are in the world of film right now, in the calendar year of 2023, there were a hell of a lot of cool-ass movies. And what better way to celebrate them than by standing alone in a room with Emma, wearing a tuxedo, and giving out spray-painted Funko Pops. Many critics, and also my parents, have said, really, Patrick, you're doing an award show? Surely there must be a better use of all our time. To which I must concede, uh, yes, yes there is. But that's true of literally all award shows. When you sit down to watch the Critics' Choice Awards, or the SAG Awards, or God forbid the Golden Globes, those are precious hours of your life that you're never gonna get back gone forever in service of a deeply silly, mostly pointless exercise. And what separates the vetoes from those other award shows, other than of course the glaring lack of celebrities in attendance, is that we are completely, 100% aware 
of how deeply silly and mostly pointless this is. None of this matters. It's all made up. I mean, look, we don't even really give these out. I only have two of them. Right now, I'm sure some of you are saying, but I love award shows. Do you though? Do you really? Quick, what film won Best Picture at the Oscars in 2006? Nope, I'm sorry, Return of the King was 2004. See, we place all of this cultural significance and all this importance on awards, and then, once they happen, they just evaporate from memory. So, why not have some fun with it? And hey, if nothing else, I promise that by the end of this show, you will definitely know who won Best Picture in 2006. But I would say the biggest thing that separates the vetoes from all those other award shows is that this show is short. We are committed to bringing this whole thing in in under 60 minutes. So that means no five hour red carpet coverage. We can knock that shit out in like 20 seconds. Emma, who are you wearing? This shirt's from my friend Anna and these boots are Birkenstocks. Dave, Dave, who are you wearing? Patrick, please go the fuck away. Yes, nailed it. And don't worry about a thousand commercial breaks. On this show, we only have to do one ad read, and I'm pretty sure most people skip that. Please don't. Those ad reads are how I pay my rent, and also pay Emma. Look, to show you what the vetoes are all about, I'm just gonna give out some awards right up here at the top of the show. You ready? Emma, drum roll please. For the best shot of 2023, the winner is... John Wick Chapter 4 for this insane extended overhead shootout. It's like a marriage of De Palma and Hotline Miami, a genuinely cool new addition to the vocabulary of action filmmaking. And another one. The award for best Pope's Exorcist goes to... The Pope's Exorcist, Father Gabriel Amorth. Look at that little guy on a scooter. Boom. That's just two down right up top. This is easy. Patrick, I think we should get back on script for the show. Sorry, Emma. I'm a flippant and casual host, like James Franco in 2011. I'm not sure you want to compare yourself to James Franco. Yep, 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 yep. I regretted that immediately. So anyway, on that uncomfortable note, let's get the show started. We're going to have a blast tonight. We're going to have this whole thing wrapped up soon because I'm hungry and I want to go have lunch after this. Let's light this candle. Hit it, Emma. Here's hoping that YouTube tutorial on electrical work didn't steer me wrong. Presenting the award for best single word title biopic, Patrick Willem. If we know anything about Hollywood in the 21st century, it's that they love to make movies based on IP. And what could be more reliable than the original IP? I'm talking about actual, real people. That's right, folks, biopics. This way, you get the familiarity of a well-known figure combined with the awards prestige of a serious drama. These movies are usually hella long, but their titles are often quick and breezy. This year, several movies entered the pantheon of great one-word title biopics alongside Gandhi, Lincoln, and Beetlejuice but only one can win. So, the nominees for best single word title biopic are Oppenheimer, Maestro, Napoleon, Priscilla, Ferrari. Okay, and the veto goes to, fairly predictably, it is Oppenheimer. I think, I think it's the best of those movies, although, I like all those movies. Emma? Presenting the award for Best Dance, filmmaker Patrick Willow. There is no doubt that dialogue is an important part of movies. Dialogue is a vital tool for writers to express what a character is thinking. To express deep, complex thoughts like, has my creation of atomic weapons doomed humanity? Or, damn, I wish I wasn't on this boat with Dracula right now. But every now and then, words will no longer suffice. 
Times when your characters need to dig down deep into their very souls and let the music move them. The nominees for Best Dance are Megan, when she dances and gets the paper cutter before she kills that guy. Magic Mike's Last Dance, a movie with many great dances, but we're going with the initial one with Channing Tatum and Salma Hayek. Poor Things, the dance scene. Barbie, the Ken's dance scene. And Maestro, Old Lenny, into club. And the veto goes to... Of course, even though it's the weakest of the trilogy, still, Magic Mike's last dance walks away with this one easily. I mean, look, the movie has so many great dance scenes, but that, that very first one, I think is an all time. Emma? Presenting the award for Best Fall, two-time Veto Award host, Patrick Willems. Film is a visual medium, and we here at The Vetoes are all about celebrating physical performances. Like dancing, falling off of things is a great way to have your characters express their inner thoughts. And mostly those thoughts are some variation of fuck, 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 fuck. This year, we got prime examples of expressing those often unspoken words on screen, along with, of course, some of the most spectacular stunt work of the year. So the nominees for Best Fall are John Wick Chapter 4, when he falls off the second floor of the club. John Wick Chapter 4, when he jumps out the third floor of that building and falls on a car. John Wick Chapter 4, when he falls down all the stairs at Sacre Coeur. Anatomy of a Fall, the titular fall. I, they gave the palm door to a movie all about falling. They replay it and reenact it so many times. And Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 when Ethan Hunt jumps the motorcycle off the cliff and then falls for a very long time. I mean, he literally delivers dialogue while falling. I'm trying to get away from this balcony. So the veto goes to... Shocker. John Wick, Chapter 4, The Soccer Corps Stairs Fall. I mean, like, you... Like, what else could it be? We've all watched that clip, like... 50 times on YouTube. It's, it's like the greatest thing ever. Here, Emma. Presenting the award for best musical performance in a non-musical, Nebula subscriber, Patrick Willems. Music and movies. They go together like perfect chocolate chip cookies and a glass of milk. Sure, you could have one without the other, but what kind of sick freak would do that? Luckily, this year gave us a packed house of musical performances and movies. And sure, we here at The Vitos all love traditional musicals, even surprise musicals that weren't marketed that way, like Wonka, but what can be just as fun is when a regular movie suddenly, out of nowhere, gives us a delightful musical performance. So, the nominees for Best Musical Performance are... In No Hard Feelings, Manny. In Barbie, Push. In Asteroid City, Dear Alien, Who Art in Heaven. In Fallen Leaves, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of our, our, our Finnish viewers, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this because I would just butcher it. I'm sorry, but the song is great. And in Megan, Titanium. I am titanium. And the veto goes to From No Hard Feelings, Man Eater. Genuinely, in my opinion, one of the best scenes of the year. Okay, wow, I think I think this is going pretty great so far. We're making good time. You know, I'm still not too hungry yet. I've still got like decently high energy levels, but now, folks, it's time to shift gears for the first of our several 
self-important tribute montages. Now, the first couple months of any year are usually considered something of a dumping ground for movies, when studios let loose the stinkers that have been sitting on the shelf and hope that maybe they'll trick some morons into going to see them so they can make a few extra bucks. But every so often, one of those stinkers turns out to... to not actually really stink. And so tonight, the Vitos want to recognize the 2023 film 80 for Brady, which, I swear to God, is actually surprisingly pretty solid. Like, I had a good time watching it. And also, uh, at the press screening, they gave out free wine in uh, these collectible glasses. So, that was cool. Here's Tom. Oh, <gasps> what a beautiful man. Let's all go to the Super Bowl. One, two, three, Super Bowl! When we come back from this, this is going to be a defining moment in my life. Let's bring out the pain train to Flavor Town! It's not erotica, it's fan fiction. Very sexy fan fiction. I bet they've got tons of drugs here, piles of cocaine. Have a seat. Gronk. Hi. Eyes wide shut. Presenting the award for Most Annoying Movie Discourse, occasional Reddit user, Patrick Willow. Since the creation of cinema, people have had dumb opinions about it. But in this era of the internet, now those dumb opinions can reach way more people, and sometimes catch on and spread around the world like a horrible plague. A few years ago, you know, there was the discourse around Anna Paquin's lack of dialogue in The Irishman, or whether or not La La Land was about a white man saving jazz. And of course, who could forget all the drama last year surrounding the Oscar snub before the scene of the alien whale ripping that guy's arm off in Avatar 2? Patrick, that was just you who cared about that. Okay, so uh, our production assistant is telling me uh, that that was just a me thing. But anyway, the nominees for Most Annoying Movie Discourse of 2023 are Barbie's Oscar nominations, movies being too long, literally anything involving Oppenheimer, sex scenes, as in, should they exist or not? And the veto goes to, yep, it had to be the sex scene discourse because this has been going on since before 2023, and it'll probably continue in the years to come. These people are weird. Shut up. Deal with it. Be adults. That's all I've got to say about that. Here we go, Emma. Presenting the award for most plot-relevant sex scene. Who else but Patrick Willow? And now, an award created just for those whiny babies who keep complaining that sex scenes can't push the plot forward and contribute to a character's emotional arc. Like, first off, how dare you besmirch Michael Douglas's work in the 90s? And secondly, as long as movies continue to tell stories about human beings, sorry folks, but there are gonna be scenes of characters go into the bone zone. And unless you're a sociopath who doesn't care about human emotions and interpersonal relationships, well, you know, these are usually fairly important to the movie. So just, like I said before, be an adult and deal with it. The nominees for most plot-relevant sex scene are Oppenheimer, Poor Things, May, December, Passages, All of Us Strangers. And the veto goes to Passages, the only NC-17 rated movie uh, nominated tonight. Uh, also a really, really good movie, and also a movie where 
you know, the sex scenes are such a, a, an essential part of it that, uh, you know, the movie wouldn't make sense without them. So, there you go. Presenting the award for Best Oppenheimer Dude, five-time Oppenheimer viewer, Patrick Willow. Oppenheimer is, in terms of sheer scale, one of the biggest movies of the year. It's one of the longest movies of the year, made more money than almost any movie this year, has the biggest explosion of the year, but just as importantly, of all the movies in 2023, this one has the most dudes. Basically, every dude in Hollywood is an Oppenheimer. Hanging out in the desert, doing science. You might not know every character's name, but you know there's the dude with the tie, or there's the dude with the bongos, or there's Josh from Drake and Josh. There are many dudes in Oppenheimer, but only one can be the best dude. The nominees for Best Oppenheimer Dude are Josh Hartnett, David Krumholtz, Benny Safdie, Jack Quaid, James Arbaniak. And the veto goes to... David Krumholtz. It had to be him. I, I mean, what a great dude. I love him. Robbie. What a good friend. He gives him oranges. You gotta eat. Shit, I gotta eat. I, I'm hungry. Okay. L l let's keep this thing moving. Here, Emma, take this. Now, some of you may remember that a couple of years ago, myself, Matt Torpy and Matt's brother Jake, who is now a ghost who haunts the studio, used to host a podcast called We Heart Hartnett that explored the filmography of one Mr. Josh Hartnett. And if you're a fan of that podcast, you might be a little bit miffed by the fact that we gave the best Oppenheimer dude award to someone other than Mr. 40 Days and 40 Nights himself. But rest assured, we took all of this into consideration. For years on the podcast, we predicted that Josh would soon have a mainstream resurgence, his own reconnaissance that we dubbed the heartening. And finally, in 2023, it arrived. Now, in two recent Guy Ritchie movies, the latest season of Black Mirror, the upcoming M. Night Shyamalan movie, and of course Oppenheimer, Josh is back, baby. And that's why today, we are giving the coveted Thaddeus P. Charlando Foundation.net forward slash returns and replacements award to Josh Hartnett. Because we called it first before all you dummies. We've watched all his movies, even the real deep cuts that no one has ever heard of. Oh Lucy, good movie. Bun Raku, pretty good movie. The Ottoman Lieutenant, not a good movie. Look, why don't you watch I Come With The Rain and then come talk to us. Anyway, Josh. This one's for you, buddy. Presenting the award for Best Shah Rukh Khan Performance, it's still Patrick Willow. Last year, in what honestly is probably the best episode we've ever done, I went to India and dipped my toe into the fantastic world of Bollywood. And of course, that meant becoming a fan of Shah Rukh Khan, one of the greatest movie stars alive. After an absence from starring roles for a few years, in 2023, King Khan returned in a major way, giving so many performances, sometimes more than one in a single movie, that he gets his own category. So the nominees for Best Shah Rukh Khan Performance are Patan in Patan, Azad in Jovan, Vikram Rator in Jovan, Hardy in Donkey. And the veto goes to Oh, 
Of course, what am I talking about? We can throw out this envelope. The winner is Shara Khan as Patan in Tiger 3. He's only in the movie for like 10 minutes, but that 10 minutes is so much better than the rest of Tiger 3. It is such like, like a giant leap up in energy and quality, uh, and his entrance is so good. Um, yes. Best Shara Khan performance, Patan in Tiger 3. Emma? Presenting the award for Best Wes Anderson Movie, our only presenter, Patrick Willow. Most filmmakers make one movie every two or three years. Every so often, when one filmmaker makes two movies in a single year, that seems like a pretty big deal. But making five movies in one year? That's impossible, right? Well, actually no. Uh, Steve McQueen did it a few years ago, and Sam Mendes just announced that he's making like four Beatles biopics at the same time, but whatever. The point is, that Wes Anderson, one of our most distinctive and celebrated working filmmakers, released five movies in 2023. Now, you might be saying, wait, I, I saw Asteroid City, but what else was there? Well, to be fair, the other four were all short films adapted from Roald Dahl short stories, but if you haven't heard of them, it's because they were released by Netflix, who dumped them all on the platform and didn't bother. Patrick, you promised you were done with this. Okay, okay, fine, fine, we won't get into it now. Let's just get to the nominees for Best Wes Anderson Movie. Asteroid City, Poison, The Swan, the Rat Catcher, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. And the veto goes to... You know what? Those short films are all wonderful, but it's... I'm sorry, it's still Asteroid City. I really love that movie. Emma? Presenting the award for Best Puke, Tommy Ake's Survivor, Patrick Willow. Normally, when you eat food, it... Oh god, is this really what the script says? Do I have to say this? Patrick, let's not pull a Joe Coy and blame the writers here. Just read the terrible joke and let's keep the show moving. Okay, fine. Normally, when you eat food, it goes into your belly and then comes out of your butt as poop. But some films have the audacity to subvert those expectations. Here are the nominees for Best Puke. The Zone of Interest. Oppenheimer. The Machine. Dick's the Musical. Poor Things. And the veto goes to... Uh, the Zone of Interest. Really weird category to give that movie its first award. Am I want to take this? I mean, it, honestly, it is probably the best puking scene of the year. Anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. And now, for a massive, jarring tone shift. It's time now to get to a staple of all award shows, the In Memoriam section. A solemn, respectful look back at those we lost in the past year. But because we are in no way emotionally equipped to handle a topic so heavy, and also we're trying to keep the show short, we decided to combine the In Memoriam with our Most Cheerworthy Moment category. So we'll be showing our favorite character deaths in 2023 movies, and the award will go to whoever gets the most applause. May the best example of desensitizing us to the brutal concept of our own mortality win. And the nominees for In Memoriam are this guy that John Wick kills. This guy that John Wick kills. John Wick. Godzilla. <sighs> Coyote versus Acme. Everyone on the Demeter, except Dracula. The guy who fell in Anatomy of a Fall. 90% of the cast of Saltburn. And the veto goes to... Wait, um... 
Hold up, everybody. Jesus Christ! Did that, that just happen? Um, okay, uh, uh, so this is not really how I wanted this part to go, but um, I guess we have to. I have just received a word that beloved character Monkey Bone has passed away. Uh, we don't have any further information at this time, just that it has been confirmed by his representatives and his family. So, in light of this shocking news, we're gonna change plans here and dedicate this year's In Memoriam to Monkey Bone, star of the film Monkey Bone. You know, on second thought, maybe we shouldn't be too sad about this. Like, that guy was kind of a dick. He almost ruined Brendan Fraser's career. So you know what? Rotten hell, you terrible monkey. Presenting the award for best heist, Wanted Thief Patrick Willow. Some have said that every movie is in some way a heist. But some movies are more heist than others because they literally are about heists. Does this category only exist because in some way I want to commit a heist myself? A case could be made. Do I over-identify with Clive Owen from Inside Man? Maybe. Do I want to put together a group of misfit crooks like in the Oceans films? Possibly. Do I know that if I had been at Nakatomi Plaza, I would have walked away with the $640 million in negotiable bearer bonds and be sitting on the beach earning 20%? Damn straight. Either way, don't armchair psychologist me about it. That's for my therapist. Or it would be if I had one. So the nominees for Best Heist are... Wonka. How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Rye Lane. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. And the veto goes to... How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Which, yeah, sure, is not about stealing a thing, but literally the entire movie is structured like one big heist, and so it's got to win. It earned it. Emma? Presenting the award for Best Post-Social Network Movie, former Facebook user Patrick Willow. When The Social Network was released in 2010, it was obviously a landmark film in American cinema and one of the very best movies of the century. But I don't think anyone expected that it would essentially create a new subgenre. Movies about the true stories of how companies were founded or products were made. Essentially, capitalism biopics. And in 2023, we got so many of these that we can fill an entire category with nominees. And so, the nominees for Best Post-Social Network Movie are Air, Blackberry, Dumb Money, The Beanie Bubble, Tetris. And the veto goes to Blackberry, a, a terrific movie that honestly, out of all of these, is the only one that really kind of understands uh, that this world and this kind of story and these people that this is about, kind of bad. They kind of suck and uh, maybe making the world worse. Anyway, good movie. More people should see it. Presenting the award for Best Fucked Up Bird, it's Patrick Willow Again! Holy shit. There were some fucked up birds this year in the movies. Like, seriously. When you see the clips of these fucking freaky deaky birds, you're gonna be like, damn. The nominees for best fucked up bird are the heron in The Boy and the Heron. The duck slash bulldog thing in Poor Things. The owl in Killers of the Flower Moon. Jarnathan in Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, and the Sewer Boys in Dicks the Musical, who I know are not technically birds, but like if I take off my glasses so my eyesight isn't good, you know, they look kind of like weird vulture things. Anyway, the veto goes to... The Heron in The Boy and the Heron, because 
Not only is that just kind of a creepy bird, he opens his mouth and like a weird little bald guy with a big pink nose climbs it. It's, it's pretty fucked up. An easy winner. Here we go, Emma. Presenting the award for best supporting performance, not nominated for an Oscar, the only person here, Patrick Willows. <sighs> Look, I know that most of these awards are basically nonsense, but we can't talk about movies without also discussing the actors. And I know we just did a category about fucked up birds, but I would also like to take the time to shout out just a few more of the great performances supporting and lead for the year of our Lord 2023. And one extra rule for these categories, we're only including performances that are not nominated for Oscars this year. Because yes, obviously, Killian Murphy and Divine Joy Randolph and Lily Gladstone are amazing. But we've all been talking about them for so many months that I want to share the wealth a little bit. Okay? Okay? The nominees for Best Supporting Performance, not nominated for an Oscar, are Charles Melton in May, December, Penelope Cruz in Ferrari, Robert Pattinson in The Boy and the Heron, Jamie Bell in All of Us Strangers, and Marshawn Lynch in Bottoms. And the veto goes to Penelope Cruz in Ferrari. I think it is frankly insane that she's not getting more awards attention. I think it's a great performance. Emma, please accept this on behalf of Penelope. And let's just keep this going. The nominees for best lead performance, not nominated for an Oscar, are Zach Efron in The Iron Claw, Glenn Howerton in Blackberry, Franz Rogowski in Passages, Andrew Scott in All of Us Strangers, Greta Lee in Past Lives. And the veto goes to Andrew Scott in All of Us Strangers. So good, makes me so emotional watching that performance in that movie. Again, crazy he's not you know, get nominated for everything at every award show. I don't, awards are silly. Awards are silly, give more people awards. Here you go, Emma. Now, before we get to the big finale for the night, we would first like to honor the 20th anniversary of a very special film. That's right, I'm talking about the film Crash. Not the 1996 Crash, the film that Mel made us very confused about whether or not we wanted to have sex with cars, no. We're talking about Crash, the winner of the 2006 Academy Award for Best Picture. See, we told you we'd get back to that. Anyway, this award goes to Crash, a movie that stopped racism for good. We have not seen a lick of it since, and for that, we would like to say, thank you, Crash. I think we miss that touch so much. We crash into each other just so we can feel something. You've got your ball, you've got your chain tied to me tight, tie me up again. Who's got their claws in you, my friend? Into your heart I'll beat again. Lost for you, I'm so lost. For you, on you come crash into me, into me, and I come into you. We crash into each other just so we can feel something, and I come into you. So now, on to the main event. Why hand out one Best Picture award when you could have a whole long ranked list? Everyone loves ranked lists. In fact, you know what? Let's hear from more people. Emma, what were your top five movies of 2023? Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Poor Things, Anatomy of a Fall, 
Theater Camp, and Killers of the Flower Moon. My top five of 2023 is John Wick Chapter 4, Bo is Afraid, Poor Things, The Boy and the Heron, and Dick's the Musical. My top five is No Hard Feelings, The Zone of Interest, Anyone But You, Anatomy of a Fall, and the Taylor Swift Eras Tour. Okay, so now, since this is my show and I created it and I picked all the winners and I make all the rules, here are my top 25 films of 2023. Number 25, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. Number 24, Bottoms. Number 23, Passages. 22, Past Lives. 21, Fallen Leaves. Number 20, The Killer. 19, Blackberry. 18, John Wick Chapter 4. 17, Bo is Afraid. 16, Anatomy of a Fall. 15, Ferrari. Number 14, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Number 13, All of Us Strangers. Number 12, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And number 11, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. And now we enter the top 10, which, look, I got to admit, was hard as hell to put together, and uh, the order changes by the day. I really wanted to rewatch all of these before putting this list together, but I just ran out of time, and today was the one day that we had to shoot this. So keep in mind that once I rewatch some of these, they might slide around into a slightly different order, but it's still going to be the same top 10 movies. And this video will remain unchanged because, as the social network taught us, the internet isn't written in pencil, it's written in ink. I have to live with what I say here for the rest of my life. My number 10 movie of the year, The Zone of Interest. Already a winner tonight for Best Puke, but obviously Jonathan Glazer's Holocaust movie has a lot more going on than just that. Its refusal to show you any of the horrific violence happening just off screen, always ever present thanks to the incredible sound design, makes it one of the most deeply upsetting movie experiences I've had in years. The more it dwells on the mundanity of the characters' lives, the more Sandra Huller talks about her beautiful garden, the more I felt like I was going insane. I bolted out of the theater as fast as I could when the credits rolled. Great movie. Number 9, Poor Things. By far the most aesthetically exciting movie of the year. I am as surprised as anyone that the The Lobster Guy is the one to bring back the kind of art-directed-as-fuck movies with the whole wacky cities built on sound stages like we haven't seen since the 90s with Junet and Caro. And amidst all of the incredible imaginative visuals, it is a joy to watch these actors set free to give performances that I don't think most people thought they had in them. But the biggest surprise about Poor Things is that as gonzo as it can be, at its heart, it's a very sweet movie about forgiveness and kindness and building a loving family with a bunch of fucked up Frankenstein pet animals. Number 8, Godzilla Minus One. The best action blockbuster of the year. Godzilla Minus One does the seemingly impossible and makes scenes of big CGI monsters destroying cities actually scary and suspenseful again for the first time in decades? But as cool as Godzilla is, and he's very cool, it's the movie's characters and human drama that really earns it its spot here. It makes them as exciting and compelling as the monster. At no point are we ever saying, come on, get back to Godzilla. If anything, we're saying, oh no, I hope Godzilla doesn't come back because I really want these people to be okay. Also, the moment that it finally drops the classic Godzilla theme, insane. So good. Number seven, Asteroid City. Every Wes Anderson movie is such a pleasure to watch, so funny and delicately made and operating with a clockwork precision unseen outside of animation, that honestly it can be a bit of a challenge to find new ways to describe it. 
And on a formal level, Asteroid City is as good as anything he's ever made, diving into new aesthetics and bringing in new influences. But this one in particular has more going on than we expect going in. With multiple levels of reality, a small town comedy in the desert that is also an exploration of processing grief into art, something that's beautifully crystallized in the balcony scene, with Margot Robbie stopping by for one of the best one-scene performances of the year. Shit, that should have been an award category. Anyway, it's also a Wes Anderson-directed science fiction movie with a stop-motion animated alien and, as we already mentioned, one of the best musical numbers of the year. I can't wait to watch it again. Number six, The Holdovers. Despite the 1970s setting and the retro Focus Features logo, this movie is never a pastiche. Instead, it is a lovely, often extremely funny throwback to the kind of American films we used to see regularly, one that comfortably sits alongside classics from decades ago. At the end of the day, The Holdovers is two hours and 15 minutes with three of my favorite characters of the year. It is about lonely people coming together to spend Christmas together. Paul Giamatti calls a man penis cancer, it's pretty much everything I could ask for from a movie. Number five, the taste of things. I love movies about process. It's why I love heist movies. I love movies about people who are good at their jobs, and I love watching the process of them doing those jobs. Whether they are master criminals, or artists, or in the case of the taste of things, chefs. It feels like the majority of this movie is just watching chefs, led by Juliette Binoche and Benoit Majumel, cook like the most fucking amazing looking food I have ever seen. I could watch hours of this. This is a movie about the joy of collaboration, about working with a person you love on work that you love and those passions intertwining. It is wonderful. Number four, Killers of the Flower Moon. Marty Scorsese, absolute madman, simply cannot be stopped even in his 80s. This is a towering masterpiece, containing within it a dark subversion of the Western genre, a love story, a horror movie, a courtroom drama, but above all, it is a story about America and the ways in which this country is built on murder. There has been way too much discourse devoted to its length, but at the end of the day, the movie more than earns it. The three hours and 26 minutes fly by, culminating in probably the most powerful final minute or two of any movie this year. The only downside to its length is that I really, really wanted to watch it again before making this video, and I just could not fit it in. But as soon as this is finished, that's what I'm gonna do. Number three which we give out, of course, the coveted Bronze Swackhammer. This award goes to May-December. Is it camp? Is it melodrama? Is it intentionally funny? And considering the subject matter, is that okay? I would say yes to all of the above. But more importantly than any of that is just what a spectacular tightrope act Todd Haynes orchestrates here starting with Sammy Birch's screenplay up through the perfectly calibrated performances by Natalie Portman, Julianne Moore, and Charles Melton, who is a revelation. Everyone in front of and behind the camera is totally in sync, pulling off this wild tonal balancing act, straddling the line between comedy, lurid true crime, and deeply sad drama. It's a movie that is just as enjoyable to simply sit back and watch as it is to analyze afterward and dig through its many juicy layers. Which means there's only two left. You can probably guess one of them. So here it is. The silver Axel Foley goes to Oppenheimer. The juggernaut that is sweeping award season starring every dude in Hollywood. But we don't talk enough about what an unusual object Oppenheimer actually is. It's a strange cross between a blockbuster and an Oscar bait drama. It's a movie about men debating science in cramped rooms that gallops forward with the pacing of an action movie. It's a movie where Einstein enters a scene with a jump scare, and 70mm IMAX is used mostly for close-ups of Killian Murphy's haunted face. 
It's a giant summer blockbuster that devotes extended scenes to a man's dreams of atomic particles colliding. It is massive, and it is intimate. And it is, above all else, a Christopher Nolan movie. And like all Christopher Nolan movies, it is about a man obsessed with his work, racing to complete it against the unstoppable march of time, and consumed by the guilt of what his work hath wrought. It is insane that this movie exists, it's insane that it is such a huge hit, and I think it is a really special movie that we'll be talking about for many years to come. And finally, the last golden veto of the night goes to my number one movie of 2023. Maybe some of you have already guessed it. It's The Boy and the Heron, the theoretically final movie from Hayao Miyazaki. Miyazaki movies always contain a lot of weird, surreal imagery, but they're usually pretty straightforward. They're aiming to please the audience. The Boy and the Heron is the most difficult, confounding film he's ever made. It is Miyazaki on expert mode. The first time I saw it, I staggered out of the theater after, frantically trying to comprehend what I had just seen. And not a day has gone by since that I haven't thought about it. If this really is his final film, it is straight up one of the greatest final films ever made. The narrative is pulled from his own childhood, it is filled with images that call back to his work over the past four decades, but it is by no means a greatest hits album. It is simultaneously an old man looking back on his life and work, and ahead to what will become of the things he spent his life building. A slow, quiet, often very eerie first half gives way to an overwhelming second half, carrying us through a spectacular fantasy world we can barely wrap our minds around that's vivid enough to populate a whole series of YA fantasy books. It is a towering work by one of the very best to ever do it. It is my favorite movie of the year. I can't wait to watch it a hundred more times. And apologies if I've used the word towering more than once here, but what can I say? It was a big year for towering artistic achievements. And I hope, I hope Miyazaki enjoys his golden veto, an award I'm sure um, he cares deeply about. Look, honestly, if Miyazaki ever found out about these awards uh, and about this 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 video right here, um, I bet he'd hate it and think it was really dumb, which it kind of is. But you know what? I bet he would not hate it as much as he hates birds, because based on the boy and the heron, this guy really seems to hate birds. He's got a real beef with them, and um, I don't I don't totally get it, but I respect it. So as we mentioned before, the vetoes are sponsored by Movie. And some of you might be saying, hey, it's a conflict of interest to have a movie distributor with their own movies in contention sponsor this award show. But I just want to assure everyone out there that um, Mubi had absolutely no idea that we were doing this. Um, I don't think they care about the vetoes. I don't think anyone cares about the vetoes. But I do want to say that the movie's Passages and Fallen Leaves are both great. Both of them made my top 25. Fallen Leaves was nominated for one veto. Passages won a veto tonight. These awards were not bought. They earned them because the movies are just really good. Look, I criticize the streaming model a lot on this channel, maybe too much, and it always comes with the asterisk of Mubi. Mubi is an example of doing it right, how I wish everyone else would do it. They release great movies, but they give them a proper theatrical release first before they go to streaming. And their platform is actually curated by human beings who select a fantastic collection of movies from around the world. It's not an algorithm feeding you the same sludge over and over again. Like, what other streaming platform is going to have Sorry to Bother You and Terrence Malick's Voyage of Time and Night of the Living Dead or an early short film by Miyazaki? Our following, Christopher Nolan's first movie, our Francis Ha and the 36th Chamber of Shaolin. Actually, Emma, they have Warrior. I love Warrior. It's actually one of Tom Hardy's most underrated performances, but my favorite part of it is that in a behind the scenes video, they were talking about the two men that they were training and they were like, Joel Edgerton's great. His brother was a stunt performer. He was just fantastic. He was very athletic. And they went to Tom and they were like, well, Tom had never done a sport. Not any sports, ever. And now he participates in Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments. It's fantastic. That's right, what Emma said. And right now, all of these movies are streaming on Mubi along with 
tons more great ones with new ones added every single day, including the aforementioned Passages and Fallen Leaves, which you should really check out if you haven't already. Fallen Leaves is 80 minutes long. Come on. You, you can commit to that. And right now, you can get a whole month of movie for free to try it out, watch a lot of great movies. If you just sign up at the link in the description down there, use my link. I, I highly recommend a movie. I'm a big fan of it. I like the movies they've released. I like the platform. Again, I think they're the ones doing streaming right. So I would like to thank Mubi for sponsoring the Vitos, an award show uh, they don't know exists and also isn't really real. So I think that's all for now. Thank you for watching. Um, I hope you, you know, maybe you've got some recommendations for movies that you haven't seen yet. Uh, again, Mubi has some really good ones from the past year that I highly recommend. I gotta go uh, return this tux because I only rented it for a day. But um, yeah. Maybe, I guess the vetoes are an annual thing now. Maybe next year we'll do them as like a live show. That would be fun, right? Right? Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Good night.